Thank you. Well, first I want to thank the organizers for having uh, in invited me to this, participate in this uh, very special uh, event. Uh, they are professionals, I'm just an amateur, so I have to warn you about this. And actually, uh, this uh, topic I'm going to talk about is uh, initially was very much uh, connected to my own research in uh, geometry, in particular the link between uh, what we call the spectrum of a manifold geometric object and really um, the sound that it can produce. So in a sense, a, a possible subtitle for my lecture could be uh, a visit to the land of instruments guided uh, by mathematics. And of course, interactions between mathematics and music have uh, many, many sides. And uh, you will, during this uh, event, you will see many kind of connections. In my case, what is really of interest to me is the connection uh, which is based on the geometry. And of course, you have more other types of interactions which can be brought into, uh, into the picture, uh, either algebraic or even number theoretic or group theoretic, any kind. So the outline of my lecture is uh, I want to really spend a, not too much time because what I'm going to say there is quite, uh, quite uh, trivial for many of you. But uh, just to set the, the, the scene, I want to talk about what I call one-dimensional harmony, which is really the harmony which uh, is uh, really connected to strings, basically, or objects, uh, instruments, which are basically one-dimensional. Then I'll move on to two-dimensional harmony. And already in one-dimensional harmony, it will give me an uh, opportunity to connect to Chinese music. But uh, for the two-dimensional harmony, really my starting point will really be Chinese music. And then uh, I will talk about more harmonies, because uh, in the, the course of history, particularly in the 20th century, some uh, other possibilities of having uh, instruments which really take advantage of the three dimensions have really taken place. And now to connect completely with the topic of this uh, session, which has to do with uh, creativity, I will show you now with uh, the help of computers that you can actually uh, make some kind of non-real or surreal instruments which actually uh, take into account more dimensions than the three dimensions. So this is really the outline of my lecture. So the one-dimensional harmony is uh, very, very simple. So I go back, uh, as you will see uh, soon, uh, I'm, I'm going to claim that this is not the right way of lo looking back. But I start with uh, Pythagoras, who definitely for him has uh, mathematics at four components, which were arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. So definitely music was part of, uh, of uh, mathematics. And for him, it was very, very critical that the harmonic relations between sounds were reflecting proportions between integers, integral numbers. And of course, there are typical illustrations of this that you can find where definitely the, the sound produced by flutes are very directly connected with the, the size of these flutes. So again, with the integer size. Actually, this, this uh, drawing is uh, completely inaccurate because Philolaus and uh, Pythagoras didn't leave at the same time, so they can be at the same time on a description. Anyway, so everything is, is very much related to the vibrating string, or if you take a flute, it's the vibrating uh, column of air. And uh, the key point, of course, is, uh, which has been noticed uh, in many different cultures, is that if you divide in half, actually you produce a sound which is the unison. And uh, of course, uh, the next fraction, which was uh, the simplest fraction you can have, besides one third, one half, of course, is two thirds, which produce a, a sound which has an interval with, uh, with respect. I mean, the interval you create this way is um, a quint. And if you shorten to three quarter, next, next fraction you can consider, you get a quart. And the very interesting thing is that uh, if you look at the, the fact that if you put together a quint and a quart to get the octave, which was uh, the unison I spoke about before, it actually reproduces the arithmetic relation that 3 half multiplied by 4 thirds is two, 2 divided by 1. So in a sense, you have converted addition to multiplication, or the other way around, depending how you look at the question. And so now this is just uh, the geometrically what, what happens in terms of the, uh, what I was saying about uh, dividing in half and uh, the superposition of a quint and a quart. And of course, uh, then uh, one idea which came about, uh, in particular in Pythagoras, was the fact that you create 
a, a new interval, which is a tone, if you just uh, look at what is the difference between the quint and the quart. And of course, uh, if you just copy what I just said concerning these uh, relations between fractions, it means that the reduction which creates the tone is actually 8 ninth, because uh, eight ni 9 8 is exactly the result of dividing 3 half by 4 third. Remember, I converted the sum into products by this construction. So if I, take a, if I subtract a, quint from a, a quart from a quint, I have to divide, which is the opposite operation from multiplication. So it tells you that, uh, and so geomet geometrically, you can superpose everything I said. So it was my first picture on the top. Then you start to introduce the using the introducing tones as difference of quints and quarts, and then you can do as, as much as you can, and you get the, the usual scale, Pythagorean scale. So in a sense, these are several illustrations of one-dimensional instruments. One thing I want to stress in particular is that in Western music, including in Greek uh, music, actually, uh, the, 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 the bell is really a circular bell, so it's really a one-dimensional object because it, it has a circular symmetry. Okay, so this uh, scale has been uh, modified in many different ways in uh, along history, and the first one was the so-called diatonic scale, but the real normalization which happened came uh, later under the name of the tempered scale, introduced by uh, Marin Mersenne, and uh, this, is, uh, this was done in his uh, article, in mean, his book, called Harmony Universelle. And it's interesting to see that uh, the subtitle of the, the book is uh, Harmony Universelle contenant la théorie et la pratique de la musique, and then uh, où il est traité des consonances et dissonances, etc. So it's a very comprehensive book about uh, harmony. And uh, here you can see uh, comparing the Pythagorean scale with the other scales. And of course, this is connected to the, what was the ancestor of the piano, where you have to make a difference between, uh, in a sense, the um, sharp and flat, and uh, therefore you have uh, the difference between, uh, I mean, having a sharp F or a flat G, which uh, have, uh, you have to double the, the black, the black uh, key of the black keys of the, of the piano. So here you can compare the, compare the value, and of course in terms of uh, the so-called tempered scale, which is a mathematically elaborate object. So you have the 12 half tones, and then you have to split this uh, domain, I mean, from one, one octave into 12 half tones. And if you want to have them exactly properly, spared, uh, properly spaced, it means that uh, you have to superpose a number, multiply 12 times by itself, and get two, So which is exactly 12th root of two. So this is the way you get the tempered scale. And here you see the differences between the values for the, the various tones and half tones for and here are the, the, the tones for the tempered scale, the diatonic scale, and the Pythagorean scale. So this is an illustration you find actually in uh, Marin Mersenne, a very interesting illustration of the various intervals. Actually, this vision that I just described, which is traditionally the way the Western people presented, can be really challenged by a very interesting memoir by a Jesuit uh, whose name was Amio, who spent about uh, 40, 30 to 40 years of his life in China. And he published uh, in 1779 uh, uh, a memoir on uh, Chinese music, which is an absolutely extraordinary book in which he basically explains that uh, some kind of compendium of 69 uh, Chinese uh, manuscripts describing the whole history of Chinese music. And, uh, very early on, actually, um, Chinese music identified the need of 12 half tones and put them in relation with a number of uh, celestial phenomena. So one thing which is absolutely uh, absent from uh, Western music in particular is the connection with the moon periods, which, uh, of course, 12 happens to be the number of uh, moon periods in a year, so number of months, if you want. And then uh, this is a very explicitly uh, shown in the various diagrams that you find in the book. By the way, so you see 1778, but you still had these wonderful diagrams which were, were printed in the book. Another point I want to make is that also in this, uh, manuscript, in this uh, document from Amyo, I mean this uh, uh, history of uh, Chinese music, 
you also find a number of uh, strict mathematical facts. So, for example, in this diagram, what he's discussing, a number of things which are strictly mathematical properties uh, connected to these half tones. And actually, um, another thing which uh, leads me to my next, um, uh, my next point has to do with a very uh, important role played by music, in particular in sacred music by Chinese emperors. And, uh, of course, there have been many musical uh, modulation uh, in this um, whole history of Chinese music. And here is, uh, it's very interesting to see this diagram here, which uh, reminds you very much of uh, the one I showed you from Marin Mersenne, although it was, uh, I mean, does contain different kinds of information. In particular, uh, very interesting information. This one is uh, very much related to, to actually uh, mathematical properties. And there is one, of course, which uh, is very much related to yin and yang, which is not uh, surprising in uh, co concerning, uh, I mean, the, con the cultural context in which all this was developed. But also, uh, again, a number of uh, comments on uh, connections you can have with uh, mathematical properties. So here is, again, some kind of diagrams you have to find in AMIO, uh, which uh, has to do, have to do with the even tone and the, and the odd tones, which of course is completely absent also from Western music. So I found this uh, manuscript really uh, absolutely fascinating and uh, shows the richness of uh, Chinese music, what is what was behind. So actually, um, the, the question of scales is uh, only, as you know, the framework for harmony for instruments, because the instruments never produce pure sounds. They always produce sounds and harmonics, that is the uh, the partial sometimes, as they are called. Uh, and uh, actually, this question of analysis of a periodic signal has been resolved by the mathematician, uh, Joseph Fourier. And uh, he showed that uh, any signal which is uh, sufficiently uh, regular can be realized as a superposition of harmonics. And so the key point, of course, is to know how, much, uh, how the energy which corresponds to a sound is really uh, you can, is located in these various uh, uh, harmonics, what I call harmonics, which uh, you may call partials also. So this brings me to my second, se second part of my lecture on two-dimensional harmonies. And actually, uh, it's very interesting to see that uh, for Chinese music, the, the very most important instrument from the point of view of uh, emperor was really the, the stone chimes. And the stone chimes are very interesting objects because um, they uh, really um, have a very distinct shape, two-dimensional object. Of course, they are three-dimensional. They have the thickness, but this thickness tends to be uniform. So actually, from the point of view of mathematics, what is really very important is just the shape as, a, as an object. But also, there were some bell chimes. And the, the, the Chinese bells are very different from the Western bells in the sense that they are not at all, uh, I mean, revolution um, objects which are, have a symmetry of revolu revolution. They are really made by two arcs. And you see also these knobs uh, that you see very clearly, which actually, actually allows you to produce different sounds on, on the bell, depending where you hit it. So in the sense, the Chinese bells are much richer from the harmonic point of view than the, the Western bells. And uh, the, the key point about two-dimensional harmony compared to one-dimensional harmony, for one-dimensional harmony, the only thing which was important was the length of the, of the string, of course. Length in the sense in which you incorporate also its tension. But anyway, there was only one parameter. Here, the, the, the new phenomenon is that you are in two dimensions, and therefore you have a, a much richer geometry, which is possible. And in this case, what is really critical for the harmonic relations uh, between sounds produced by such a, an instrument, actually, they do reflect the geometry of the domain. Uh, I'm sorry. So yeah, so I'm going to show you uh, a short uh, presentation of the various shapes of, uh, of um, the, st the stone chimes.
。现在我们看到这个角度是比较大的，但是呢，在考古这里记载，他说这个角叫做金沟，金沟的角度叫一距有三，距一距是多少？一距有三，一百三十五度。我们发现出土的很多边区，它的这个机构的角度都在出来。石器除了单个以外，还有成套的，称为边器。在中古文物中，保存比较完整的边器，当属曾侯乙边器。Okay, so binchin is the stone stone chime. And so what uh, is explained there is in fact a very key parameter which actually was changing from one dynasty to the next was actually the angle which uh, at the top of the, of the stone chime. Another very important parameter is where the hole is, uh, is dig to really suspend the, the chime. So these were two critical parameters which meant that from one dynasty to the, to the next actually the fundamental music produced by the chimes was, was different because, of course, the, the basic tone is given by the size of the, of the, of the, chime, of the stone, but then uh, the key point is that the further harmonics, the other harmonics, uh, really were very much related to the shape. And, of course, if you change the angle uh, at the top of the stone, you do change the geometry of the stone, and as a result, you, you do change the, the, the sound produced by the, by the chime. 商代的宗教已经掌握了石器的发音规律，无论石器刻有什么花纹，外形都大体相同。Sorry. Okay, so here are the. You can find also these uh, stone chimes in the document by Amio, which I mentioned, and also insist on the richness of the of the bells. And again, it really also points to, I mean, the. Uh, geometry of the of the stone as being really very critical for the music produced so I, at least i should uh, have you listen for a few seconds to a stone chime so that you get an idea of what it is so here is it is Okay, so these were the, 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 the geometry which I was describing and which were very important for me, so for, for the stone or for the bell. And uh, as, I, as I mentioned, I mean, again, these are very, very critical uh, elements. So for my, all, all what I wanted to say about this two-dimensional um, harmony is it's a very strong relation with the geometry of the domain. And actually, uh, of course, I stress that because it, there were, these instruments were present and as basic instruments in the Chinese music. But of course, you can also, um, I mean, consider this in any musical instrument, in particular because they contribute to this identity. And uh, for example, even if you take a violin, of course, the basic sound is produced by the, the core, I mean, the string. And um, of course, you have the, the um, harmonics of the string coming in. But also, I mean, the, 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 what creates the, amplifies the sound of the violin, of course, is the box. And here you, you see, here are the vibrations that you can see on the, on the um, box of the, of the violin. And here are typically with by stroboscopy, how you, you can see the, really the, that's the lower part of the violin vibrating when you produce various sounds. So here are the various sounds produced. So you see again, that uh, the geometry of the violin, uh, I mean, of the surface of the violin, the wooden surface, uh, is of course uh, very much, uh, I, mean, the geomet I mean, the way the vibration of the, the, the violin uh, happens is very much connected to the uh, note which is produced. So here is an interesting and very, of course, critical interaction between the sound that you produce with the string and uh, actually what the sound that you, finally the violin is producing because of the, of the box and the, the way its uh, box is vibrating. So of course uh, you know that uh, mathematically you can prove that there is not just a finite number of such harmonics, there are actually infinitely many of them. In terms of uh, what we can listen to, of course we know we have only a window of this because the, the ear cannot hear more than a certain uh, frequency. And so this is, uh, of course, the uh, 
generalization of the result of Fourier for strings, but it applies to any geometric space. Its vibrations are all infinite. And um, what is uh, very important, as I suggested before, is that the, um, the I mean, the way these, um, this spectrum, these uh, harmonics are distributed is a very important piece of information on the geometry of the space and is directly, directly connected to geometry of space. Actually, there is even, a, that's actually the way I got uh, involved in that. There was a famous uh, question by a probabilist, uh, but was interested in this, Mark Katz, who asked, uh, can one hear the shape of a drum? I mean, drum being the most, the simplest two-dimensional instrument you can think of. And of course, the whole idea is that whether, uh, behind this question, is whether really with the knowledge of the spectrum, can you recover the shape of the drum? And actually, this question is not uh, fully um, understood yet. Uh, I mean, uh, we now have uh, explicit uh, description of some drums which are, uh, have different shapes but are producing the same sounds. But all these drums have, in a sense, their boundaries have angles. So there's still the, the question, uh, very critical for mathematicians, whether if you, don't, if you do not allow the, the boundary of the boundary of the drum to have angles, whether you can still have this um, property that uh, the, the spectrum determines the shape of the drum. So let me move on to more harmonies now. And uh, actually in the 20th century, uh, many other paths have been followed to create harmonies. And uh, in particular, uh, other sound spaces have been uh, uh, explored. And also towards the end of the century, of course, the uh, use of the computer and the fact that we could generate artificially sounds and, of course, more and more sophisticated sounds became really a very fantastic tool to really enhance the capacity of creating new sounds. So I'm going to show you um, an instrument which was created in the 1920s, so-called theremin. So I'm going to show you a very short video of the man who created uh, this, Mr. Theremin. Of course, the video goes to the 1920s, so it's not a, a very good video in terms of quality. So what's very interesting in this instrument is that uh, in a sense you've seen that the way you produce sound, you don't touch anything actually. There is a wave which is produced and then it's my position in the three-dimensional space that actually mo modify the sound. So it's a typical example of a three-dimensional instrument, truly three-dimensional instrument. And just to enhance this I, with a better quality video and better quality sound,
Okay, so now let me move, come on to come to the part which is a really virtual harmony, so really the part which is really connected to creating new instruments in a sense. Uh, so I want to show you a uh, few examples, uh, as, um, and in this case, harmonic relations between sounds can be fixed by imitating geometric spaces of arbitrary dimension. So I'm going to show you uh, some, uh, actually, musics produced by a differential geometer, a friend of mine, Denis de Turk, and uh, playing with the idea that you, you play a piano, but the piano you replace the strings, the usual strings by geometric spaces, and so uh, the, the whole description will be to show you what kind of, uh, of a space he is using. So the first one he will be using is just a, a circle instead of a string with the ends fixed, and uh, then we'll move on to more complicated spaces later on. So now you replace the uh, one-dimensional circle by a two-dimensional sphere. And uh, so in this case, you get uh, a different kind of music. So let me try and get it. I'm sorry. is going to the three-dimensional sphere. Six-dimensional sphere. Okay. Okay, so now, um, I'm sorry, I, I, I think I went a bit too far with the previous one. Let me, so I think you will probably hear again the same thing for one, for a few seconds. Okay, so now I move to something which is more music, it's just not superposition of notes, which is the Romanza movement from Beethoven's Sonatina.
Okay, so now another piece which uh, again is using uh, for various instruments these again the harmonics from various uh, geometric spaces, which are all projective spaces. One is the two-dimensional complex projective space. The other one is the comp the projective space of the Kellen numbers, and the other one is the quaternionic projective space. So objects which are very complicated objects, and uh, so. Here is the handles transformed by this. So now I'm moving back to this uh, piano exercise that you have been hearing a few times. Instead of putting as geometric uh, space, a sphere, you put a torus. And of course, for the geometry of a torus, which is very important, what is the relative size of the two sides? If you, if you think of a torus, the thickness and the, the circumference of the, of the torus. And so in this case, you get, the, again, the, the exercise that you have been hearing a few times. Okay, so now I'm moving to another Taurus music, in the, but um, sorry, I was too quick. Uh, to show you um, another piece which is now recognizable as a, as a piece of music, which is the Wide Rider of uh, Robert Schumann. And uh, so I'm going to... Here we go. Okay, another attempt on the, one of the uh, pieces of back to part invention number four. And uh, again, with a torus piano, with a, you see the size are very close to being equal, 11 and 13.
And then um, I'll move on to the last one, which is uh, Chopin's Valse in D-flat. Here we go. Okay, so you see the effect of changing just the harmonics uh, in uh, just a very simple, some s simple pieces. Uh, changes completely the feeling one has uh, about the, m the music. Thank you very much.